Marcus Crassus Every era has its filthy rich famous person. Today it's people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. But in the days of Rome, it was a man named Marcus Licinius Crassus. Not only was he one of the wealthiest men of ancient Rome, he also may have been one of the richest men in human history. Marcus Crassus was not particularly popular. He didn't have the kinds of military accomplishments as his rivals like Julius Caesar and Pompey the Great. Though to be fair, he was the man who defeated Spartacus. What Marcus did have were guile and guts, and this led him to an extraordinary amount of wealth. But there was one secret ingredient that often doesn't get mentioned. Marcus became insanely wealthy due to something that's still making people wealthy today. I'm talking about real estate. Real estate was big business in ancient Rome, just as it is today. In the late Republican period, there was a huge influx of migrants entering the city of Rome. This resulted in the rapid construction of buildings called insulae. Insulae were made of stone and designed to accommodate lots of people. They were essentially apartment buildings only built with cheap materials to house non-Roman citizens flooding the city. They often collapsed and killed people. Believe it or not, it was Emperor Nero who fixed this problem years later when he established building reforms to make all new construction projects safer. What happened in Rome is happening right now in plenty of places across the world. A booming population made land a hot commodity. People who owned land in the city were suddenly able to make massive profits by building cheap accommodations. Putting down cheap insulae in every square of available space made a handful of landowners very rich. Nobody knows exactly how many of these apartment buildings were made, but there are estimates of around 50,000 of them during the late Republic. Long story short, this was how Crassus made his fortune. He used a team of slaves, architects, and builders to repair crummy properties. He continued to accumulate all the property he could, buying and repairing as he went. Soon enough, he owned most of Rome. But Marcus Crassus was so much more than just a landowner. He was an active politician and one of the key figures in Roman politics. He crushed the revolt of Spartacus in 71 BC. He loaned money to Julius Caesar. He was also the consul of Rome. He most likely could have been much greater if it wasn't for his desire to seek military glory. Even with all his wealth, Marcus wanted to be a glorious leader on the battlefield. And this was what led to his brutal and downright ghoulish end. Marcus Crassus thought his rise to fame would be defeating the Parthian Empire in battle. In 53 BC, Marcus marched 40,000 soldiers into Parthia to conquer territory and become immortalized. He hadn't anticipated the 20,000 Parthian soldiers to be so formidable. At the Battle of Carre, the Roman army was quickly surrounded and decimated. The horse archers with the Parthians massacred the Romans. It was like shooting fish in a barrel with fire arrows. It's not clear what happened to Marcus, as there are several different versions of how he died. There were no Roman survivors of the battle to provide eyewitness testimony. Still, it must have been terrible. One account claims Crassus was decapitated and had his head brought to the Parthian king. Another story claims Crassus had molten gold poured into him. Either way, the richest man in Rome met a grisly death. The Good Life I've told you about Marcus, the richest man of the Roman Republic, but I didn't really tell you what life was like for him as a wealthy Roman. The short version is that life was good. In fact, life was good for all wealthy Romans. Let me tell you why. Romans with money did not live in the noisy and smelly byways of Rome. They dwelled in the hills outside Rome, where they enjoyed a luxurious lifestyle surrounded by slaves who catered to their every whim. They lived in Roman versions of mansions, dined on exotic foods, and held exclusive dinner parties. There were two main types of houses for wealthy Romans. In the city, a wealthy Roman would live inside something called a domus. This was usually a single-story building complete with beautiful marble pillars and statues lining the hallways. The floors would have been covered with vivid mosaics and the walls decorated with the latest artwork. There were multiple bedrooms, courtyards, and gardens for relaxation. In the countryside, wealthy Romans lived in a villa. Villas had much bigger rooms than a domus did. They also had more servants to take care of the larger property. These villas typically came complete with underfloor heating. 
The system worked by pumping hot air from a fire into tunnels underneath the floors. Villas could be positively humongous and were usually complete with luxurious baths. They had huge bathing areas with pools, sweat rooms, and even a cold room called a frigidarium. As a wealthy Roman, your food options were unlimited. Poor Romans were stuck eating vegetables and porridge, while rich Romans guzzled wine and enjoyed extravagant meals of peacock, roasted parrots, and milk-fed snails. Would you rather live in a domus in the city or a villa in the countryside? Opulent Tombs Archaeologists were excavating the site of a future solar energy plant near Rome when they unearthed something unexpected. They uncovered an ancient Roman necropolis that contained 67 skeletons. The skeletons were buried in 57 tombs. But these weren't ordinary tombs, they were the tombs of the rich and famous. Well, maybe not famous, but definitely rich. The tombs date from between the 2nd and 4th centuries, the real peak of the Roman Empire. The skeletons were found still wearing their jewelry and fancy footwear. There's no doubt these are the bony remains of the Roman elite. Lead excavator Emmanuel Giannini said the team found several skeletons still wearing expensive stockings and rich people's shoes. They still had golden jewelry dangling from their wrists and skeleton necks. When the researchers analyzed their bones, they found no evidence of stress or physical labor. These were people who had not worked a day in their life, at least not physically. They must have been from the upper echelon of society, able to afford being buried with expensive jewels that would make your average grave robber salivate. It goes to show that there truly was a class of ultra-wealthy Romans, and apparently they all purchased tombs at the same cemetery. The elite necropolis is a massive 21 hectares, located about 50 miles from Rome. Archaeologists think the wealthy Romans were trying to create a burial place that was similar to their own homes in life. The walls of the tombs were decorated in lavish cloth. Archaeologists found amulets, pottery, coins, shards of glass, and lots of jewels. They also found many people buried together, suggesting the wealthy liked to be buried with their immediate family members. Some skeletons were even found with their arms over one another in a loving embrace. I wanted to give a big thank you to Carol Freeman 2544 and the Yeti Slayer for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like this. Baia, the Roman Sin City if you were a wealthy Roman, you knew how to party, and that meant taking regular vacations to the most luxurious party towns in the Roman Empire. Out of all the coastal resorts and sinful cities enjoyed by the Roman elite, none was more famous than Baia. It was a place of such unabashed debauchery that legend says it was destroyed by the gods. Baia is currently underwater. It sank hundreds of years ago into the Mediterranean Sea. There are still a few pieces of it above water, but most of it is currently occupied by fish. Before its destruction, Baia was a favorite resort town notorious for its decadent offerings. It was more popular than Herculaneum, another wealthy resort town that was buried when Mount Vesuvius erupted and destroyed Pompeii. Modern scholars think Baia was a mix of Miami and Las Vegas. It was where rich people went to party and openly enjoy their vices. Starting around 100 BC, during the Roman Republic, wealthy Romans started building luxury villas along the coastline of the Gulf of Naples. The tradition continued all the way through the Roman Empire and even after the destruction of the Roman Empire. When the Goths took over Italy, they continued using Baie as a resort town. They enjoyed the Roman baths and good-feeling energy of the coastal paradise. There are no specific activities I can tell you about that the Romans partook in while frolicking in this party town. It was described in ancient sources as a den of licentiousness and vice. Historians called it the enemy of decent girls. But there aren't any specific details to say what visitors to the town did. Visitors such as Julius Caesar, Pompey, Emperor Hadrian, Caligula, and Emperor Nero. Hadrian even died in Baie in 138 AD. As for its destruction, nature can be thanked for that. Volcanic activity in the 3rd century began sucking Baie into the Mediterranean. Over the last 2,000 years, it has sunk up to 30 feet deep in some places. The Roman Economy 
Ancient Romans grew fabulously wealthy because they had an excellent economy. At the same time, the Romans had a pretty terrible economy. They experienced the same boom and bust of many other empires. But just what exactly did the Roman economy look like 2,000 years ago? And was the economy really to blame for the rapid fall of the empire? The city of Rome originated at some point around the 9th century BC. At the edge of the Tiber River, farming communities banded together to establish fortifications against their enemies. The first few hundred years of Roman history is a mystery. There are no reliable records, only legends. Romans believed their great city was established in earnest in 753 BC. It was ruled by kings until the very last one was overthrown in 509 BC. From then on, Rome was a republic, a shining jewel of democracy. Then in 31 BC, Caesar Augustus ended democracy by defeating Mark Antony and Cleopatra, and Rome soon became a monarchy. After 27 BC, Rome was an empire and not a republic. Let us start with the Roman economy in the Republican period. It was largely based on agriculture. Farmers grew crops and sold them in the city. The city itself was defended by a volunteer militia group composed mostly of citizens and landowners. Farmers worked the land in times of peace and picked up arms when Rome went to war. War was the real driving force of the economy. Rome found itself growing and getting into longer, more expensive wars. It was no longer possible for men to fight and farm. Rome needed an army, and they needed food to feed the army and the people. So the economy evolved. Agriculture took on a much grander scale. Huge estates produced massive amounts of food, which helped grow the economy. The work was typically done by slaves to save money. One elite family could produce a massive amount of food using slave labor. Small farms even found themselves bankrupt because Roman elites dominated the industry by using slaves, pushing small family farms out of business. Grain was the hottest commodity there was. In fact, Rome was frequently going to war to find more land to grow more grain. It was one of the big reasons they invaded North Africa and Egypt. Grain was grown by farmers and shipped throughout the vast empire, keeping the economy going. With the rise of the Roman Empire, the economy became a whole different kind of beast. Suddenly, there was trade going on at a scale never seen before by human society. Silk was brought along epic trade routes through mountains and foreign lands from China to Rome. Exotic animals were imported from Africa. Cotton came from India. Iron and tin were shipped across the sea from Britain. Slave miners in Spain shipped gold and silver. Many historians believe that at the height of the empire, the economy was so great that the average person had a similar lifestyle to an 18th century person living in London. Then the economy collapsed. When the empire stopped expanding, they slowly started to run out of resources. They were also very dependent on their supply chains. When they started to lose control of their territories in the early part of the 5th century, supplies stopped being sent to the heart of the empire. There were so many people in Rome that they depended on grain and goods from as far away as Egypt to survive. When Rome started losing control of these places, the food wasn't coming to feed people. There was a point in the 5th century when Rome was almost completely abandoned because there wasn't any food to eat. In the end, the boom went bust. Civil wars, a collapse of infrastructure, declining birth rates, frequent invasions and the outsourcing of their food led to the destruction of Rome. They were killed by their own bloated economy. Caesar Augustus If you had to guess which historical figure was the richest of all time, what would your guess be? Would you think it was the legendary King Solomon from the Bible? Or maybe Mansa Musa, the African king said to have held more money than any man who ever lived? Or maybe it was John Rockefeller, who had a net worth equivalent to about $400 billion in modern currency, three times more than Jeff Bezos. Those would all be wrong answers because historians believe the richest man of all time was Augustus Caesar, first emperor of the Roman Empire. His net worth has been valued at $4.6 billion in current currency. He owned about a fifth of Rome's wealth and controlled Egypt. 2,000 years ago, Egypt accounted for an estimated 30% of the GDP of the entire world. But just who was Caesar Augustus and how did he get so rich? 
He was born with the name Gaius Octavius in 63 BC. He was the great nephew of Julius Caesar, which was how he became appointed heir to the soon-to-be empire prior to Julius's death in 43 BC by assassination. Caesar Augustus inherited the personal fortune of Julius at the young age of 19. He entered the world of Roman politics before he could legally have a drink in modern America. He formed alliances, squashed his political rivals, and waged civil war. In the Battle of Actium circa 31 BC, Augustus crushed Mark Antony and the fleet of Egypt. This ended the era of ancient Egypt and the Roman Republic. When Augustus returned to Rome, he was a hero. Just before Augustus made himself the very first emperor of Rome, he made an appeal to his citizens. He told them he was an ordinary man who led a modest life and who wanted the best for his people. In reality, he was so rich it doesn't even make sense. He instituted a system of taxation, expanded the empire, and captured lands as far away as the Middle East. In the year 6 AD, he even conquered Judea. It was all this conquering that grew the Roman economy, just like I explained earlier. The reason Caesar Augustus grew so rich was that he was at the very top of the wealth pyramid. Then, in the year 14 AD, he died outside Naples. The Roman Senate proclaimed him a god. The Senate Speaking of the Senate, these were the seriously wealthy people of ancient Rome. The Roman Senate was one of the most successful governmental institutions of the Old World. It was created at the dawn of Rome 2,500 years ago. It also survived the fall of the Roman Republic, continuing to exist in its own capacity during the Roman Empire. When the Empire fell in 476 AD, it remained alive, though it hung by a thread. The Senate wasn't obliterated until the Middle Ages. But just what exactly did a Roman senator do? Much like modern senators, they were mostly rich old men. The word Senate actually translates in Latin to old man. These rich old men were the ones who created laws, managed expenses, dictated religious matters, and sent troops in the war. They gave honors to the generals who fought in combat. They made all the important decisions, and of course, the old men of the Senate lived a good life. Through most of Roman history, senators were appointed. An elected official was the one who appointed new senators. Then, when Rome became a monarchy, it was the emperor himself who decided who became a senator. In both cases, senators were supposed to be men of high moral character. As you can imagine, there was plenty of room for corruption. The thing about being a senator was they had to already be wealthy. It didn't pay money to be a senator. Instead, senators spent their own wealth to help run Rome. They also weren't allowed to be bankers or merchants, nor were they allowed to have criminal records. They were basically old rich men who wanted to control the world and to do so with their deep pockets. Let me take you through a day in the life of a Roman senator so you can get a feel for what being wealthy in Rome was all about. A senator awoke at dawn inside a lavish household. His slaves were already up, dusting the floors and polishing the marble statues. A senator would put on his tunic, then his toga, and slip on his sandal-like shoes. But before leaving his dressing room, he would also put on his latter clave, which was an emblem of office worn over his toga. When the ordeal of dressing was over, the senator would wash with cold water and eat a simple breakfast, usually consisting of bread, milk, fruit, eggs, pancakes, and maybe a glass of wine. There would usually be honey and cheese as well. Slaves prepared the food and presented it, and if the senator wasn't hungry, then it was wasted. Then the senator embarked upon his workday. It usually lasted for six hours, from dawn until noon. After arguing with other old men all day, the senator returned home to be waited on by his slaves. Roman Wines Just outside Rome, a winery from 2000 years ago was recently discovered. It was unearthed in the ruins of the villa of the Quintili. The villa was once home to some very wealthy Romans. Archaeologists think the winery may have been an entertainment venue a place where rich Romans go to experience winemaking. It may have been the ancient Roman equivalent of going on a winery tour. The Villa of the Quintili was first excavated in 1998. It's an extensive ruin sprawling across the Alban Hills south of Rome. Researchers have found gates and towers and lavishly decorated rooms. The villa was so big it was like a stronghold. 
In 2017, archaeologists embarked upon a new mission to learn more about the people who lived in the villa. They discovered all the hallmarks of a winery, including the original equipment, an area for smashing grapes, a vat for collecting grape juice, and channels leading to the wine cellar. All the features are typical of a winery from the second century, but this one was a little different. Archaeologists say the amount of luxury in this winery is beyond normal. It may have been a tourist winery. The winemaking area was surrounded by three enormous dining rooms. Visitors likely gathered in the rooms to sample the wine and enjoy a fancy banquet. Wealthy Romans could have relaxed in comfort while listening to the quiet sounds of scantily dressed slaves making wine from scratch. According to Emlyn Dodd from the British School at Rome, powerful Romans had a bizarre obsession with agricultural labor. It was romanticized by the ruling class, who were so out of touch with reality they didn't understand how labor worked. This winery may have been a place where curious aristocrats gathered with their friends. They watched winemakers work as if they were watching a theatrical performance. The Vomit Collector I've talked so much about what it's like to be a wealthy Roman, maybe I should take a break to tell you what it was like to be the poorest Roman. There was one man in the Roman Empire who had the worst job of them all. He was the vomit collector, a man whose career was not something he brought up at parties. To understand the duties of the vomit collector, I need to take you into one of the most lavish affairs held by wealthy members of Roman society. Romans with money held banquets. These were not normal dinner parties. They were spectacles of debauchery and excess. Romans would gorge themselves on a feast of honey, dates, lobster, blood pudding, sausage. Really, I could go on forever. The tables would be covered in an array of bizarre foods, the likes of which you cannot find in a restaurant today. They would wash all this disturbing food down with cup after cup of wine. You've probably figured out where I'm going by this point. What happens when a few dozen rich Romans gorge themselves silly on an assortment of food and drink? They need to purge. And that's where the lowly vomit collector comes into play. The vomit collector's duty was to hang around the banquet and wait for people to vomit. When a Roman had stuffed their face with jellyfish omelets and lamb's brains, they needed to yak. The vomit collector cleaned it up. This is an excellent example of the poorest in Roman society having their face rubbed in the obscene wealth of the richest in Roman society. The truth of Roman vomiting is a little murky, though. There are only a few accounts of Romans barfing because they eat so much. Historians are torn on whether vomit collection was a real job. The one thing that's for sure is that wealthy Romans ate too much and likely did get sick from time to time. Roman writer Suetonius described how Emperor Claudius was often so stuffed when he finished his meals that he would need to lie down. Then he would have a slave tickle the back of his throat with a feather so that Claudius could lighten the contents of his stomach. Emperor Vitellius was even worse according to the legends. He supposedly had four feasts a day, including meals of flamingo tongue and pheasant brains. He was so gluttonous that he would vomit between meals so that he had enough room for every banquet. Does any of that food sound good to you? Let me know in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. The Patricians of Rome Roman emperors were at the top of the social pyramid, and so were the senators. But who else in Rome had access to obscene amounts of wealth? The answer is a group of people known as the Patricians. As the complete and total ruler of the Roman Empire, the emperor lived with his family in great luxury. They lived in the most splendid villas, they ate the best food and dressed in the best clothes. Their life was full of extravagance and easy indulgence. The emperor's immediate family didn't have to do very much, so they enjoyed days of leisure. Even without modern amenities, they enjoyed plenty of pastimes. They learned music, wrote poetry, went hunting, and raced horses. But here's one thing not many know about the ascension to emperor. When one emperor died, determining who was next in line was not always so easy. Succession was not hereditary. The Roman throne could pass to anyone relatively close to the emperor. It could be his favorite courtier, his mistress's son, his brother, or pretty much anyone he liked. The only catch was that the new emperor had to be approved by the Senate. As a result of this potential power, the emperor found himself surrounded by desperate men and women hustling for position. This meant his villa, his royal palaces, everywhere he went, the emperor was followed by Roman groupies. They weren't necessarily related to the emperor, they were often patricians. 
Patrician families were the aristocrats of ancient Rome. They were the class underneath the emperor and his relatives. They were landowners, they controlled religious institutions and had their hands in the political pies. Most patricians came from very old families. Families that inherited their wealth through generations by simply being born. Males born into a patrician family received the best education available. They would have private tutors who taught them all about mythology and geography. They learned literature and could speak multiple languages. They learned about the law and about military tactics. This was in direct contrast to people born into normal families who received very little in the way of education. This wealthy class also enjoyed other privileges, not just being better educated. Ordinary citizens were expected to perform some military duties in the Roman Empire, but if you were born to this special class, you could be excused from potential combat. At the end of the day, patricians did not have to deal with much work or responsibility. Their only real work was trying to get as close to the emperor as possible to gain even more power. Roman Inflation Starting around the year 211 BC, the national currency of Rome was the denarius. It was a silver coin used by Romans for everyday purchases, like someone today might use a dollar bill. It wasn't the only coin, but it did last 400 years until the 3rd century AD. The denarius was roughly the size of a nickel. A single coin was equivalent to a day's wages for an ordinary Roman craftsman. 4.5 grams of pure silver was an honest day of hard labor. The denarius was a little different from modern currency. Its worth was not based on the state of the economy. It was backed by the silver in the coin. The silver itself was what gave the money its value. How exactly then does the value of a coin made from silver decrease? The value decreases when the amount of silver added to each coin decreases. The Roman Empire only had so much silver in its borders. They could only mint so much money. It would be like if the US ran out of paper to print bills and suddenly there was no more money being made. Something similar was going to happen if Rome didn't do something. Seeing no other choice, Roman Emperor slowly but steadily began reducing the purity of the silver in every coin. They used cheaper materials to produce more coins. By the year 161 AD, the silver content of each coin had gone from 4.5 grams to about 3.4 grams. Eighty years later in 244, the denarius had been reduced to 45% of its original value. Ten years later, it was down to 5%. In 265 AD, the purity of a single Roman coin was 0.5% of where it started 400 years earlier. Coins started being made of bronze with the faintest coating of silver. This was the end of the Roman Empire. It was runaway inflation on a level so severe it bankrupted the realm. Prices of everyday items had soared by over a thousand percent. Hyperinflation brought the Roman people to their knees. It was like Germany after World War II when people used entire suitcases of devalued money to buy a piece of bread. Modern economists have estimated Roman inflation skyrocketed 15,000% between the year 200 and the year 300. By 301 AD, one pound of gold was worth 75,000 denarii. The Roman Slave Wealthy citizens of Rome had as many slaves as their villas could handle. Some might say Romans enjoyed an even more luxurious lifestyle than modern rich people because they had slaves to do their bidding. But where did these rich Romans get all their slaves? And how much did they cost? Slaves were captured in battle. In the Roman Empire, it didn't matter the color of a person's skin. If they came from enemy territory, they could be captured and sent back to Rome to be sold. Wealthy Romans purchased their slaves at the market. They could buy an abandoned child for a few denarii. The child didn't even need to be abandoned. Roman law stated the father of a household could sell his own kids if he was down on his luck and needed cash. The sad truth of the matter is that even Roman citizens could easily become slaves. At the height of Roman slavery, an estimated 40% of the population in Italy were slaves. If you didn't own land or a business, becoming a slave in the very place you were born was a real possibility. 
The more expensive slaves were those who were young or who specialized in a trade. Purchases were final with no refunds. When the slave was purchased, they became their owner's property for the remainder of their life. They were only granted freedom if their master allowed it, or on very rare occasions, if the slave somehow earned enough money to buy their own freedom. Now, here are some more numbers to shock you. Historians believe the richest people in society had up to 500 slaves. A rich man with a lot of property and a large villa could have 500 people working for him for nothing. When it came to emperors, they owned roughly 20,000 slaves. Not all slaves were treated terribly, though some definitely were. Prize slaves were treated much better than slaves that were considered replaceable. For example, a particularly good cook would be treated like an exceptional employee. On the other hand, slaves who did things like work in a mine were treated like cogs in a machine. Their health often suffered from hard labor, and they perished at an earlier age than most. At a wealthy villa, a slave had many tasks they needed to perform in a day. They had to fire up the underfloor heating system in the morning so the floor was toasty. They needed to walk the children to school. They had to clean, wash clothes, and tend to the garden. Meals needed to be prepared. Rich people needed to be dressed and bathed. Yes, quality landowners had their slaves bathe them like little babies. When the master of the house had a party, slaves were sent to escort the guests home. Slaves would walk ahead of the guests with a lit torch to light their way. By the time the Roman Empire began to crumble, slavery was in decline. Not because wealthy people didn't enjoy their slaves, but because of the economy. With runaway inflation, landowners no longer wished to pay for slaves. They preferred paying low-wage workers, who required less upkeep than maintaining a barracks of slaves. Would you rather be wealthy today or be wealthy and alive in ancient Rome? Let me know in the comments and thanks so much for watching. Be sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already and come back soon for more awesome videos from the channel.